A vicious vaccine war breaks out as the EU threatens to divert doses from the UK. Joe Biden launches a barrage in the first week of measures on climate change and much else besides. And we note how the pandemic has changed the world in ways that will echo for decades. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show. It seems only yesterday that we were being told the way of the European Union was that of enlightened internationalism. By turning its back on the EU, Britain was showing its preference instead for a closed nationalism. Well, that treasured European self-image was robustly pushed from the top floor window this week as the vaccine wars turned extremely ugly. The driver for this has been the EU's extremely slow start in rolling out the vaccines for its citizens, while the UK and the US, for that matter, utilised an emergency vaccine certification process. The EU stuck to its standards and what bureaucratic measures. And when I say bureaucratic, if I tell you that reportedly one of the many obstacles that slowed down the approval of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is that it has to have labels printed in all 27 EU languages, you get some idea what I'm talking about. The EU was furious this week that AstraZeneca had reported that glitches in its European supply chain meant that it wouldn't be able to supply all the doses it had signed up for as quickly as had been hoped. There would be 60% fewer short-term doses, around 50 million. And it was perhaps the coexistence of that piece of news alongside the humiliation, the abject humiliation, that Brexit Britain, having been mocked non-stop, not unfairly to be fair, over the last 12 months for multiple missteps and errors, was nevertheless pushing ahead many times faster than the EU in rolling out vaccine to its citizens. And for once it was genuinely because Britain did something well and was able to do so because it acted independently of the EU. Yes, many of its businesses might be strangling in the red tape of paperwork, preventing them from exporting to the EU, but at least this was a genuine Brexit benefit. Having been criticised earlier for passing up the opportunity to be part of the EU vaccine procurement programme, it came out looking extremely smart. The point is that the UK sealed its deals with the various vaccine manufacturers very quickly, signed contracts with lots of money up front for vaccines when we had no idea whether those vaccines were going to come good or not. It signed with AstraZeneca in May last year. Not only that, but having been burned by international suppliers not delivering PPE equipment, for which there had been contracts when the world was scrabbling for as much as they could get of it, the UK insisted on a clause that said that the UK had first rights on any vaccine manufactured in the UK. This gave AstraZeneca the ability to start building its supply chain to deliver a products going from zero to huge scale overnight, which is an incredibly difficult thing to do. And AstraZeneca's chief executive, Pascal Soria, pointed out in an interview that they'd experienced just as many supply glitches with the UK vaccine as they'd had with the EU one. It was just that they had the extra time to sort those problems before the vaccine was ready to go. By the way, AstraZeneca is, like most of these companies, providing vaccines for COVID-19 at cost price. This is a non-profit venture. Some European leaders suggested the company was selling to others at a higher price, and that was why Europe was getting shortchanged. That's not correct. While work was already beginning on their UK supply chain, Germany, the Netherlands, France and Italy, acting as an alliance, reached a preliminary agreement with AstraZeneca based broadly on the same approach as the UK agreement. That was then blocked by the European Commission who had been lobbied by other member states and said that they now had to negotiate for the whole of the EU, countries could not go it alone. And they then took an additional two months. They signed a contract at the end of August that sources at the company said had no material changes from the original, didn't put as much money up front. According to Euro Intelligence, it carried out negotiations with the company in the same way it conducted Brexit talks. It tried to lock in a perceived short-term price advantage at the expense of everything else. The delay seemed to be that the EU wanted a number of partner sites involved in manufacturing the vaccine, focusing on spreading the action across various countries. But the delay is largely because the yield at those partner sites has been lower than expected. 
Meanwhile, the EU vetoed buying so many vaccines from Germany, the successful Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, because that would have been seen to be unfair. And so as good an order had also to go to the French Sanofi operation. Unfortunately, the Sanofi bet didn't come good. Sanofi has instead said it will work to help increase the production of the German one. The EU then started throwing its weight around, demanding that every dose from AstraZeneca must be provided as if they'd signed up for a consignment of widgets, not putting together a massive process at a scale unseen in human history. And if they couldn't get it from the European factories, they said that vaccines should be diverted from the UK and sent to the EU instead. EU Justice Commissioner Didier Reinders said this, The EU Commission has pushed to coordinate the vaccines contracts on behalf of the 27 precisely to avoid a vaccines war between EU countries. But maybe the UK wants to start a vaccine war. Solidarity is an important principle of the EU. With Brexit, it's clear that the UK doesn't want to show solidarity with anyone, which is about as hostile as it gets. And all these for a drug that they hadn't yet approved. The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine has been used on millions of British citizens and it was still illegal in the European Union, even as the company was being threatened for not delivering it. That legal approval is expected on the day that this video is being shot. The veteran journalist Robert Peston tweeted that one pro-EU source at AstraZeneca had said to him, I understand Brexit better now which is some indicator of how much they've been enjoying the experience. And then it got even more weird when Germany's leading financial daily newspaper, Hendelsblatt, claimed that the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine had only 8% effectiveness in people over the age of 65, which is completely not true. And it's the level of misinformation you'd expect from a raving conspiracy theorist, not a respected financial journal. And to cap it off, the EU organised a raid on AstraZeneca's Belgium facilities, reportedly to check whether the company was telling the truth about the quantity of doses and where they were going. On one level, this will all pass. Once the road bumps have been navigated, volumes will start to surge. Before long, it will pass into ignominious memory. But not for a while. As things currently stand, the UK and the US look like being amongst just a small number of countries that will achieve the degree of vaccination required to get back to any sort of normality in 2021. And this is what's fed the interest in the UK now, which I foreshadowed last week in following Australia's example of a hard border to keep out possible new vaccine-busting variants of COVID-19 from the rest of the world. Now, while the EU has been turning against itself and its neighbour in a fit of panic, Russia and China have been using their own vaccines as leverage. Deals for less well-tested but available right now, Sputnik and Sinopharm, are being made across the world. Obviously, there's nothing in recent history to think that would ever come with strings attached. I mean, obviously. Where there are vaccine wars, there's also scope for vaccine diplomacy. It's a phenomenon that the countries of the West, who currently are defining success purely in terms of getting vaccine into the arms of their own citizens, probably need to be paying far closer attention to. Now, in a moment, we'll look at some of the rest of the week's news. But first, the last couple of weeks have seen a significant backlash against the lockdown sceptics. They've been attacked vigorously in the media, labelled as dangerous, held up to have been shown to be wrong, really now just voices that should just go away. In the last couple of weeks, a new website was set up to debunk their arguments, to highlight their allegedly wrong things they've been saying, so people would know that their words are not to be trusted. But are the critics right? What are the best arguments now being deployed against the lockdown sceptics? Which questions have genuinely been settled, which remain debatable? Are there arguments for sceptics make that their critics have ignored? And should it ever be the case that people holding a certain position should just now shut up? You could call it lockdown zealots versus sceptics. It's probably a better word than zealot, but you get the idea. Well, we'll be looking at all of that in the video to be launched next week on Monday, 7 p.m. UK time. Join me then. In the US, meanwhile, Joe Biden has been signing anything within reach. Proclamations, memorandums, old bus tickets, 
but mostly executive orders. He signed 22 executive orders in his first week, massively more than any other recent president, where nobody else gets above low single digits and most are zeros and ones. Even one of his biggest cheerleaders, the New York Times, called on him to slow down a bit, which is a reflection that American presidents are not supposed to be all-powerful, ruling by fiat. The majority is meant to go through the legislature. And one of his major topics on focus for the flurry of paper was, of course, climate change. Rejoining the Paris Agreement, of course, which is the symbolic bit, but also putting climate change, quote, at the centre of US foreign policy and national security considerations. That's actually one of the important bits and something that I've argued for in the past. As the critics of action on climate change tend to point out, the US acting alone has a minimal effect on the overall emissions produced by humanity worldwide. If you actually don't think anything needs to be or indeed should be done, then you point to that with a shrug of the shoulders and say, well, what's the point? If you do think that the issue is important and needs to be acted on, which you can do without running around and flapping your arms around as some of the campaigners and the politicians do, then it's obvious that with many countries, nobody will own more than a fraction of the whole. And therefore, all of those countries need to act in order to make the difference. And therefore, countries with enormous world clout, such as the US, need to bring their influence to bear on working out how the rest of the world comes along. It's not an easy question to answer. And particularly now that economic competition over the new cleaner technologies is starting to emerge as the driving force for change, there are some solid, enlightened self-interest reasons why you would do that. As things currently stand, it's still in the so what territory. Biden announced that the US would host a leaders climate summit in April. Now, there hasn't been slow progress to date because there were too few international summits. Let's face it. But, you know, well, we'll see. More significant will be whether they can implement any kind of programme within the US to make solid progress on decarbonising without losing the support of the entire population. The signs from the first week are not exactly encouraging. One of Biden's very first actions was to cancel the Keystone XL pipeline, generating lots of publicity from day one, about 11,000 jobs lost. Now, it turns out, according to the Houston Chronicle, although that number may be roughly accurate, nearly all of them were temporary jobs related to the construction phase, as you would expect, not ongoing jobs. But even so, the question is whether that's something you want to be seen doing with a dash of a pen on your very first day. The optics are great for the climate campaigners, but rather alarming for a lot of the others. And none of those concerns will have been much alleviated by Biden climate czar John Kerry creating the new learn to code meme of the Biden era. For all those workers whose jobs currently rely on fossil fuels, learn to make solar panels. Now look, if you study the history of capitalism since the start of the Industrial Revolution, there have always been new industries displacing old ones. And in that process, there have always been disgruntled stakeholders in the old ways, who eventually, after significant pain, have to adapt to the new circumstances. And that's bad enough normally, but we recognise that it happens because better processes and products come along, and it's all part of the stuff that creates wealth. If you're making something like that happen because you as a government are following a strategic imperative, even if you're right, and respect the fact that many of the people you have to take with you doubt that, even if you're right, you've got to handle it better than this. Big top-down government programmes spending billions of dollars don't have a stellar track record of success. Well, we watch with interest. But what we're probably seeing is the swinging shut of the door on the very brief moment of opportunity for US politics to pull back towards the centre. Biden stood as a centrist. Many of these early executive orders on critical race theory and equity, on transgenderism, on various matters, stem more from the party's radical base. Now, it doesn't mean he's going to emerge as a wild-eyed radical, but neither is it the centrist administration that would stand firm against the party's worst instincts. And then on the other side of the aisle, having had a moment of appalled reappraisal following the events of January the 6th, it seems that Donald Trump is quietly reasserting his grip on the Republican Party. 
Maybe it was the polling that showed that if Trump launched a new Patriot Party, it would outpoll the Republicans in the process guaranteeing untouchable domination by Democrats. In any case, only five Senate Republicans seem likely to vote for the second impeachment, and figures such as Liz Cheney, who took a stand against the former president, are now under severe attack within the party. Cheney's facing an attempt to oust her from the party leadership. She's been condemned by the Wyoming Republican Party. Primary challengers are lining up. Ironically, Trump's enforced silence on Twitter might turn into his and the party's greatest asset, since it will reduce his ability to make off-the-cuff, ill-advised interventions. But that said, it's never a good position for any party to be captured by a single charismatic individual, especially if loyalty to that individual is going to be strictly required, which seems to be the process that's underway. In other news, the UK has been wallowing in the news that it hit the 100,000 COVID death figure this week. At the end of the day, it's just another number, happens to have some zeros at the end of it. But it is an obvious moment to reflect on the, the many and various people whose lives have sadly been lost. The good news is that the early real-world results on the rollout of a vaccine seem to be suggesting that the UK's approach to delaying second-dose jabs and maximising the rollout of the first jabs, that is actually proving to be effective. With the effects of the recent lockdown and presumably the very early beginnings of the effect of a vaccine, I mean, it takes several weeks for strong resistance to form after you've had the jab, of course. The UK is seeing cases and hospitalizations, not yet deaths, beginning significant decreases. Of course, just to underpin why the EU is so desperate, that isn't the case in a number of European countries. Portugal is being particularly badly hit right now with soaring cases and its hospitals seriously overwhelmed and running out of oxygen supplies. The oxygen network completely collapsed at Fernando Fatsenka Hospital in Lisbon and 100 patients had to be moved quickly elsewhere. At least their desperate situation wasn't self-inflicted. But a report released this week suggests that the fatalities from New York's care homes have been undercounted by up to 50%. Governor Andrew Cuomo made unfortunate headlines when he said this, Incompetent government kills people. More people died than needed to die with Covid. Well, he meant someone else, of course, but people quickly pointed out that it was him, not Donald Trump, in March 2020 who issued the directive that required nursing homes to accept Covid-positive patients from hospitals. Now finally, in one glimmering light of reality, the BBC has apparently now removed a page that was aimed at children that claimed that there were more than a hundred genders. It seems that they had complaints from people who had accused them of confusing children with, quote, made up rubbish. For once, the institution in question backed down, rather than simply labelling the complainants as being bigots, which may be a sign that the new Director General Tim Davies declared war on BBC ideological bias is actually starting to have some effect. Well, we'll wait and see, though, eh? Now, in a minute, we'll have a look at some feedback and the final thought for the week. But first, this week saw the latest letter to corporate leaders by Larry Fink the CEO of BlackRock and known as the most influential man in the world that you've probably never heard of. BlackRock is the world's biggest asset management firm. And he said in this letter that the time had come for the leaders of all major corporations to issue their plans to achieve net zero carbon rather than waiting for regulators to require it. And when you look at who's doing what, there are a number of major corporations doing more to transform their businesses on climate change, more than any government. Is this now the way that business is going to work in the future? If so, is it a good thing? Or is it businesses getting distracted from what actually makes businesses work, setting them, and us all, up for failure? Or is it just woke virtue signalling, a symbol of corporations being invaded by a younger workforce who think that ideology should be driving corporate agendas? Some of you guys know that I worked in corporate social responsibility for a couple of decades. This is my area, well, my former one anyway. Now I'm going to take you through some of the big changes that are shaping your world that you probably don't know about. I guarantee it'll be a lot more interesting than you might think. No jargon, no tedious corporate speak. By the end, you'll understand the most important force driving change that people almost never talk about. If they do, then they usually get it completely wrong. 
And if you're one of the podcast listeners to this episode, it's actually already part of that world. I promise that this will be thought provoking for you as well, not just the same stuff that you've heard before. That's my big promise. Can I deliver? Join me for the video going live next week on Wednesday at 7pm and you can find out. Doing a video looking at the legacy of Donald Trump's term as president was always going to get some reaction. This is one that's representative of several that came in on the same theme. Don't agree with your election conclusion. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. The fact that most people don't understand this concept is truly concerning. Assuming the election was fair when there was no transparency is very dumb logic. Well, of course, I didn't express a view on whether the election was or wasn't fair. The video wasn't about that. It would have totally hijacked the focus of the video if I'd made any such comment either way. What I said was that the election system has to work or else you don't have a democracy. So if you get to the deadline and you haven't been able to prove fraud in court, then for the sake of the country, you have to concede gracefully. By all means, carry out an inquiry after that point if you believe there was information that didn't come to light. But my point was that Trump had been priming for accusations of fraud from the beginning, even at the start of the 2016 campaign. So when someone says it over and over and over again in advance and then over and over again after the event, it's no surprise that their most committed supporters totally believe it, evidence or not. But by recklessly persuading a large percentage of people that the system is rotten, you create forces that will tear that system down. Well, good, you say. Well, there's no time I can think of in history when the thing that replaced it was anything other than massively worse than what it replaced. Should the elections be run better? Definitely. Should there be total transparency? Absolutely. Should people be working to improve the system over the coming years? Highly advisable. Otherwise, you'll live this again and again. Does any of that make it a good idea for a political leader to seed the idea in millions of people's minds that they are bound to win? And if they don't, then it must be fraud. Definitely not. All right. I haven't pulled out a specific comment from the live stream experiment that I did on Wednesday. Some of you liked it, some of you didn't. Notwithstanding the technical issues, which can be and some have been fixed, I wasn't hugely persuaded it adds an enormous amount. The comments fly past quickly, although I can scroll back to see them while the thing's going on. It didn't prove an efficient way for me to answer questions live. I see a number of other channels where they do regular live streams and there's a big focus on encouraging questions using super chats, which are tied to small donations, which mean that the questions are sticky, they don't scroll past, there's fewer of them because only those who are prepared to pay. And I get that. And for those channels, they become regular live streams. They get a regular boost to their overall channel income. I see other channels where they do an opening segment where they talk about something interesting and then they break look at the questions that have come in and then do another segment to answer those. That might also work, but we'll see. I'll certainly try it again, but I'm looking for the niche that format will fill in the sort of content that I focus on where it will add real value to the channel. Any ideas you have would be very welcome. Let me know in the comments. We thought the pandemic would be a temporary interruption. Once it had faded away, life would quickly and vigorously go back to normal. But it has changed the world, and the impact is going to be felt for decades. Now, we've seen this before. The book I'm currently reading is Prophet of Innovation, a biography of the economist Joseph Schumpeter, who talked about the creative destruction of capitalism. He was describing how dynamic, interconnected and international capitalism works as it was hitting its stride. John Maynard Keynes famously described the era like this. The inhabitant of London could order by telephone, sipping his morning tea in bed, the various products of the whole earth in such quantity as he might see fit and reasonably expect their early delivery upon his doorstep. They regarded the state of affairs as normal, certain and permanent, except in the direction of further improvement, and any deviation from it as aberrant, scandalous and avoidable. Does that sound familiar? Well, that ended with World War I, and the reaction in the aftermath by countries to try and become self-reliant, 
autarky made the impacts worse and led to the Great Depression. Now, COVID is likely to have some similar effects. How far reaching, we don't know. The integration of the global economy that we've taken completely for granted has suddenly been revealed as immensely fragile. What we thought were freedoms turned out to be hmm, temporary privileges. Travel bans, quarantine hotels, all signs that we now have governments preventing citizens from leaving their country via hard borders. Assumptions from the Bill Clinton, Tony Blair era, but it didn't matter where your goods were made. They were blown away by the PPE scramble at the start of the pandemic, finally laid to rest this week by the EU's likely move towards confiscating vaccines. We've learned that when the crisis strikes, international agreements, contracts for rule of law will be overridden by countries operating in panic mode. And it's that, more than anything, that's now going to change the world on a much longer time scale. Businesses such as airlines and holiday resorts will become speculative, risky enterprises, always vulnerable to a lockdown. Does that mean that the era of cheap travel is over for the time being? In the future, countries will reshore a lot of strategically important supplies that were happily farmed out to distant supply chains. Essential medicines, PPE manufacture. Why did Britain do so well on the vaccines? Because of the knowledge that Trump might invoke the Defence Production Act to grab vaccine supply for America. So they spent billions helping British-based firms to buy facilities in the country to produce vaccines. And then, ironically, it was the EU that proved that they were right to do so. So yes, essential medicines. Sit down and brainstorm what else should be on that list, because governments currently are. Should we have essential tech manufactured in Taiwan, for instance? We've already noted that we shouldn't have China in charge of key infrastructure. Reshoring such things doesn't make them cheaper. Obviously, that's going to have a cost. And if you're going to add fears relating to food security, what happens if major weather events hit several of the breadbasket regions of the world at once? The integrated global economy of the last 50 years has created prosperity and helped to reduce poverty worldwide. It's often been more resilient in the face of disruption than any alternative you could think of. If that were to be replaced with a new approach to autarky, we would be heading for another Great Depression. The world has an interest in recognising for sure that things have changed. But avoiding the temptation to lurch from one extreme to the other would be a good idea. If we give up all the things that worked in the recent past in order to correct the things that failed, we're going to learn some hard lessons that we thought we'd already learned back in the time of the young Joseph Schumpeter. Well, that's all for this week. My thanks as always to the good people who support this channel on Patreon. With your support... I've been able to produce three videos per week in the last few weeks and that has started to pay off in terms of a a hopefully you like the content and b the channel has been seeing increased views and a, an uptick in subscribers and that simply isn't possible without you so thanks to you all if you would like to add your support for the independent fact focused and non-ideological content that i aim to produce here please go to patreon.com forward slash malenbaker Either way, have a great week. My name is Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show.